So uh, it's a pleasure to have uh, Professor Mariana Malad here with us today. She got her bachelor's, MS, and PhD in 2001, 2003, and 2007 at uh, Universidad Federal de Minas Gerais. She did a postdoc in 2007 and 8 at uh, City College in New York. Then she came back to Brazil in 0809 at CIFMC and 2010 at IIP. Uh, she was, as we were, we were chatting, uh, she was a visiting lecturer at the uh, University of uh, Gothenburg and Chalmers University in 2020 in, uh, in Gothenburg in Sweden. And since 2010, she is uh, at uh, Universidade uh, Nacional de Brasília, uh, UNB. Uh, UNB. Uh, and today, uh, she's going to talk to us about uh, the title of her talk is Less is More, Engineering Robust Not Aligned Semi-Metals with Vacancies. So, Professor Amalad, uh, thank you very much for accepting uh, talking to us, and uh, the microphone is yours. Thank you, Josh, for the nice introduction. Uh, just a comment, I was a visiting lecturer at Chalmers and University of Gothenburg between 2016 and 18. And then I was there in different other occasions for shorter uh, visits. So uh, thank you for the invitation and Edson, and thank you all for attending. So yes, yeah, so I'll talk about uh, a scheme for uh, fab fabricating topological nodal line semi-metals, which are robust to different kinds of um, uh, perturbations. And the scheme is very simple. We just propose that by introduce, introducing vacancies in ordinary materials, you can achieve this uh, phase of matter. So here in the background, you can see the famous uh, Copacabana sidewalk in Rio de Janeiro. And the reason that uh, it's here, it's not just for decoration, although it's, it's rather beautiful, but it also represents uh, uh, a non-symorphic symmetry, which I'm going to be talking about today, and particularly this uh, pattern of the Copacabana sidewalk uh, belongs to a wallpaper group, uh, P2MG, and I'll talk about that, uh, what is a wallpaper group in a moment. So, but before, let me acknowledge my co-workers. And so uh, I'm going to be talking about a set of papers, some of which have been published, some are under review. Uh, and these are my uh, co-workers in this uh, selected papers, Professors Fanny Yao from uh, UNB, Igor Zutish from Buffalo, and Wei Chen from Pukihio, and two PhD students, uh, Fu Yun from uh, UNB and Mateus from Pukihio, have also helped us with uh, some key uh, calculations. So. Uh, let me give you a very brief summary of my talk. So just to settle a, a, a short dictionary uh, for some concepts which I'm going to be referring to in the bulk of my talk. So I'll give a, a brief overview about wallpaper groups, non-symorphic symmetries, and topological semi-metals. And then I'll move on to our uh, proposal, which is to get uh, robust topological nodal line semi-metals out of vacancies. And then I will show you uh, with an, uh, a simple, effective uh, model and a symmetry analysis how these engineered symmetries can uh, grant you uh, nodal lines in the spectrum, which characterizes a nodal line semi-metal. And then I'm, I'm going to show some DFT results that confirm the, th the analytical predictions uh, for two types of materials, uh, vacancy engineered graphene and borophene. So wallpaper groups. All right. So wallpaper groups uh, are the 17 crystallographic groups in two dimensions. So in two dimensions, there are only 17 uh, uh, crystallographic groups called wallpaper groups, which are classified according to the present, to the symmetry, uh, uh, classified according to the symmetries which are present in the 
in each group. So these symmetries are translations, rotations, and reflections, and which are symorphic spatial symmetries. And then there is also one in two dimensions. There is also one type of non-symorphic spatial symmetry, which is a, a, a glide, which are glide lines. So here you see the 17 wallpaper groups and with a, a tiling, a, a tiling kind of of pattern, uh, which is representative of each one of the groups. Okay, so uh, what are non-symorphic symmetries? So first of all, symorphic symmetries are the ones which involve only point group transformations, like, for example, a translation or a rotation, a reflection, you just, let's say, a rotation, you just rotate around an axis, uh, a reflection, you just reflect around a plane or a line, translation, you just shift your crystal by a specific amount, but non-symorphic symmetries, they involve uh, space, uh, um, uh, 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 they involve point group transformations followed by a non-primitive translation of the, of the unit cell of the crystal. So there are two types of non-symorphic symmetries, glide and screw. So in two dimensions, you have glide lines and three dimensions, you have glide planes. And in three dimensions, and, 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 and screw axis is only possible in three dimensions because to rotate and then translate along an axis, you need at least three dimensions. So uh, let's look at these two patterns, which uh, this one is rep the, the right and the right and left feet are, uh, when they are positioned in this way, they are representative of a pattern which has a glide line in two dimensions. And then the, le the, the left hand, when it rotates, you, you know, when the palm comes uh, downward, uh, this uh, gives you, th this pattern uh, is uh, invariant by a screw axis. So these are the unit cells in both kinds of patterns. So as I was telling you, this pattern, it has as a symmetry, a glide line, which is composed of a reflection, not plane, line, because you're in two dimensions, you don't talk about plane transformations. So uh, it's a reflection line followed by a non-primitive translation of the unit cell. So in this case, you, you, as you're gonna see, you have to translate by half the unit cell in order to uh, get back the original uh, lattice or pattern. And uh, for the screw axis, you have an n-fold n -fold rotation axis, which for this pattern here is a two-fold uh, rotation by uh, uh, 180 degrees, followed by also a non-primitive translation, which in, in this case is also half of the unit cell. So here, here you can see the, how the transformation goes. So here you reflect, but then uh, upon reflection, the feet will not fall on top of where they were before. So here in shadow, you see the original pattern and here you rotate by 180 degrees, but again, you don't recover the original positions of the units. So you have to translate in both cases by half of the unit cell. And that's uh, what, make, uh, what makes this um, transformations non-symorphic. So, Okay, moving now to the topic of topological semi-metals. So broadly defining topological semi-metals, uh, semi-metals in general are uh, um, materials in, in where the, there is a gap between the valence and the conduction band different from a uh, normal metal where there is no gap uh, uh, throughout the brilliant zone, uh, the valence and uh, conduction bands um, are, uh, 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 coincide. But for a semi-metal, there is a gap between the valence and conduction bands, except at points or sometimes lines in the brilliant zone where these bands touch. So the most famous example is the Dirac semi-metal, where the bands touch at, uh, at isolated points in the, in the corners of the brilliant zone. And this gives you a fourfold degeneracy at this point, because each band itself is already two-fold spin degenerate, and then when these bands touch, they uh, they produce a fourth-fold degeneracy, a point degeneracy. 
But then there is also the very famous vial semi-metal where this four-fold degeneracy is split into two into two two-fold degeneracies, which are related to each other by time reversal symmetry. So here TRS mean means time reversal symmetry. And then um, you have nodal line semi-metals in which instead of a touching at points in the brilliant zone, the bands they touch or 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 interpenetrate along lines in the brilliant zone, which can be closed lines, loops, or um, open lines, open lines. And I'm I'm going to be focusing my talk from now on on nodal line semi-metals, which are interesting for different uh, number for 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 various reasons, and some of which are the fact that they uh, are linked to novel topological properties, um, and they are they have been hypothesized to to be uh, precursor precursor um, band structures for high T superconductivity. So you can use such types of materials in proximity to uh, superconductors. And um, in doing that, is it might be possible to achieve high temperature superconductivity and topology or topological superconductivity. Uh, these materials, nodal line semi-metals, have also uh, been um, reported to present non-trivial magnetism. And there are other interesting properties which are not every day you can find in the literature. Okay, so when you have a band degeneracy, say a nodal line degeneracy like this, one of two things can happen when this degeneracy is uh, subject to perturbations, right? So either perturbations will gap out the degeneracy, so or or yeah, so remove the degeneracy by um, making these two bands uh, go apart, and in this case, this uh, nodal line or band degeneracies in, in general, which are gapped out by perturbations, are called accidental. And in the sense that they are they they existed before as a result of symorphic spatial symmetries and or non-spatial symmetries like time reversal symmetry, particle hole symmetry, or chiral symmetry, which are non-spatial symmetries, which can also uh, yield uh, band degeneracies in the spectrum. But this band degeneracy, so-called accidental. Uh, they also require tuning of the Hamiltonian parameters. So in this sense, we say that these degeneracies are only protected by the underlying symmetries, but not guaranteed in, because you, you also have to, for example, for example, the included perturbations have to be, uh, their strengths have to be under uh, a certain regime or, or, or value. For the for these degeneracies to 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 survive, otherwise they are gapped out. Contrary, uh, differently from this case, we you have symmetry enforced uh, band degeneracies. In this case, I'm showing a symmetry enforced nodal line, which are, as the name says, enforced by spatial symmetries. But this kind of symmetries have to be non-symorphic, and uh, in this case. For whatever arbitrarily large value of perturbations and also varying the whatever parameters there, there are in your Hamiltonian, the symmetry, uh, the, the band degeneracies will not be lifted uh, by such perturbations or deformations of the Hamiltonian because they are, they have to be there as a result of non-spatial, of non-symorphic spatial, spatial symmetries. So, if one is then looking for nodal line for a nodal line semi-metal which has which is symmetry enforced, you can just go and find an intrinsically non-symorphic material, and then you then you just have it because if there is a non-symorphic symmetry, then you know that the band degeneracies they are symmetry enforced. Uh, in, and here I show you some examples of compounds, three-dimensional compounds which are non-symorphic and which realize uh, nodal, uh, symmetry-forced nodal line semi-metals, or at least have been conjectured to realize 
symmetry enforced nodal line semi metals. Uh, the, the drawback with, with this kind of uh, uh, materials is that they are chemi chemically and structurally not very simple, right? The proposal that we suggest is, uh, is to take a different route and approach and you just go and get an ordinary in the sense that can be even monoatomic material and structurally simple. And, uh, and so an ordinary symorphic material, and then you make it non-symorphic by poking holes in it. So by removing some atoms from the structure. So, and, and, and thus by that you can change the symmetries of the material and make it non-symorphic. So let's have a look at these uh, two cases of pristine borophene and graphene. So these are the structures of pristine borophene and graphene. They, 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 they are similar. Uh, so here's the hexagonal structure of graphene that everyone knows. Uh, borophene is, has the same structure, except that there is a boron atom in the middle of the hexagons. So this is a monoatomic material made of boron and graphene of carbon and both of these uh, structures have this. So these two structures have the same set of symmetries, uh, which are reflection, two reflection planes perpendicular to each other. And in the crossing of the two reflection planes, you have an inversion point. So these symorphic symmetries yield uh, uh, the well-known Dirac points where the bands, the valence and conduction bands touch. However, under perturbations, for example, spin orbit coupling, this, uh, get, this uh, Dirac points are gapped out. So as uh, illustrated in this figure, uh, instead, if you consider vacancy engineered borophene or graphene in which you just remove some atoms uh, in the structure uh, and you don't do it, um, randomly, these vacancies are distributed periodically in the structure and in, in, definite, uh, in, in, in a definite way to form a specific pattern. So if you do it in borophene in this way or in graphene in, in this other way here, so what you get is that one of the reflection planes is uh, replaced or gives, gives uh, uh, room to a glide plane, which here you can see uh, represented by these blue lines, and um, so there is, so now you have a non-symorphic lattice, and as a result, the gapped Dirac points are replaced by robust nodal lines in the spectrum, which survive uh, strong perturbations, or arbitrarily large, large for that matter, because when the nodal line is enforced by the symmetry, it can it cannot be. Uh, destroyed by symmetry preserving uh, perturbations. So uh, these are two examples of vacancy engineered borophene and graphene that we consider, but we actually consider two species for each uh, type of material. So for borophenes, we consider uh, B10 and B16 structures where the we use here these uh, lower index to indicate the number of atoms in the unit cell for each type of vacancy engineered structure. And uh, for graphenes, for graphene, we consider C10 and C44, 44, uh, uh, with this kind of unit cells here. And here you, you, you get to see a, la a larger chunk of the sheet, how it looks like. So it looks like you're playing with Lego tiling, right? In the sense that you're trying to create patterns or specifically non-symorphic patterns by uh, which in the sense of the symmetries that they have, they are like tiling patterns from the wallpaper groups, uh, but you're doing that in an atomic scale. And it, particularly you're doing that by removing atoms from a crystal, right? Okay, so now I'm gonna, change uh, gears a little bit because I'm going to move to a symmetry analysis, a theoretical uh, an analysis of an effective model, which represents the kind of structures of real materials that we propose. 
So in fact, if you take a real material, uh, a real vacancy engineered borofin, for example, like this, you see that the basic, the basic ingredient uh, in this kind of structure or in the kind of in the structures that we propose that makes it non-symorphic is the fact that you have um, uh, stripes of field or, or field stripes which are separated from each other by hollowed stripes and they follow this up and down or kind of zigzag pattern so if you represent this type of crystal by an effective minimal lattice which takes into account the fact that you have two two structures field and hollowed uh, units which are arranged in this way so this kind of up and down or zigzag stripes uh, then you realize that the minimal lattice is it, it will look like this and it has a, a very simple unit cell that it's made out of, it, 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 it's constructed out of only uh, four in intracell degrees of freedom. Uh, and here you see the glide uh, plane. Here it's uh, just for sake of, of visualization effect. It's, uh, it's the glide and reflection are drawn like planes, but they are to just lines because you're in a, on a two dimensional um, uh, structure. And uh, the difference is now that the inversion point does not reside at the cross sections of the glide and reflection lines, but it's a bit shifted. So anyway, let me come back to what I was saying. So with uh, minimal lattice like this, uh, it can be um, described by a two dimensional four by four Bloch Hamiltonian, H, K, X, K, Y, where K, X and K, Y are the the momentum in the two dimensions and this age matrix is a four by four matrix or four by four where four indicates the number of inter intracell degrees of freedom uh, and also it can be proved that if you have glide line and inversion point this implies the existence of the reflection line so you just have to analyze how this matrix behaves under g and y because r is already implied so let's do that. So this is the invariance relation of the Bloch matrix, the four by four Bloch matrix with the four by four uh, matrix that represents the glide plane uh, transformation. So this is the, the, the Hamiltonian matrix has to obey this equation, right? So this is the so-called invariance relation and uh, this implies, this equation, this invariance relation implies that uh, the glide plane transforms the Hamiltonian eigenspace, the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian in this way. So if you take uh, eigenstates Kx minus Ky at band alpha, alpha is the band index, uh, and then uh, you multiply it by the four by four glide plane matrix, the result is that you move to the flipped momentum in ky eigen uh, sub eigenspace of the hamiltonian times the phase so here you just have this uh, a picture that represents the transformation between the positive ky and negative ky and vice versa sub eigenspaces of age right and also there is a change in the band index so if you start with say band alpha you can go to another band alpha prime upon uh, glide transformation but then if uh, if you consider the subspace ky bar uh, equals zero or plus minus pi these are the glide plane invariant uh, sub uh, eigenspace because for these values of ky zero or plus minus pi this invariance relation becomes a commutator which equals zero and therefore, which means that in this subspace, uh, the invariant subspace of the glide plane, uh, the Hamiltonian, the Bloch Hamiltonian and the glide plane share a common set of eigenstates. And in particular, so now you, you see that Kx, Ky bar are eigenstates of G with this eigenvalue. Uh, and, 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 and then this, okay, so this eigenvalue can actually be computed analytically for the simple case of a four by four effective Hamiltonian. 
and 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 for this kind of lattice here you can compute the g matrix the glide plane matrix by hand and it has a simple structure it's a four by four matrix that looks like this where this little g matrix is a two by two matrix of this of this form and the the, the, the big g is a four by four matrix so here it's a two by two zeros and here is the two by two uh, the two by two uh, uh, diagonal matrices. Uh, good. So you can just co compute the eigenvalues by hand, and they are uh, twofold degenerate. So they, there are four eigenvalues which are pairwise degenerate, uh, uh, but particularly these are the eigenvalues at at k y bar zero plus minus pi are like this. And uh, you see that they are twofold degenerate, so uh, exponential i k x divided by two, two, uh, two, two eigenvalues are equal this this function of k x, and the other two is the same function with a minus sign. So if you just analyze how these four uh, pairwise degenerate eigenvalues behave as you swipe the k x edge of the brillier one zone from minus pi to pi you see that these uh, complex numbers, they wind around the half of the half of the unit circle in the, on the complex plane. Uh, so two eigenvalues go from minus, minus i to i through one. The other two go from i to minus y through minus one. And uh, at these extreme points of the eigenvalue trajectories, I, I, here I'm showing the eigenstates which are associated to the extreme points of these eigenvalues trajectories. And uh, this behavior of the eigenvalues of the glide plane matrix imply that the eigenvalues, the corresponding eigenvalues of the Bloch matrix, of the Bloch Hamiltonian, uh, will have to behave like this. So as kx is changed, is varied from minus pi to pi, so the four eigenvalues, the energy eigenvalues of the Bloch Hamiltonian will have to pairwise cross at some value of kx. So this is a result of the these eigenstates connecting in this way when uh, the eigenvalues of the Bloch Hamiltonian are considered. So which, which implies that the bands have to cross pairwise at some point, not specified, but at some point along kx axis. Okay, but this is a general uh, demonstration. Uh, actually, there is some raw algebra involved in this uh, uh, red arrow. I'm just showing the result. So, uh, but this is a, a general proof that is not that does not rely on any specific form of the Bloch Hamiltonian. It only it, it's only based on the be behavior of the eigenvalues of the glide plane matrix and how this uh, affects the eigenvalues of the Bloch matrix. But to, to be more specific, to have to gain some more intuition how this happens, let's consider, for example, a definite tight binding Hamiltonian, right? So here is a four by four matrix. So the entries are kx, ky dependent. And let's consider, for example, the type of tight binding Hamiltonian in which I consider hopping, uh, uh, nearest neighbor hopping between uh, sites inside the unit cell, which are represented by these amplitudes in this function. And then I might also consider hoppings uh, between neighboring unit cells along the horizontal direction, which will be given in this way. And then in the vertical direction, there will, the hoppings will be parametrized in this way. And then also you might consider hoppings uh, 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 along the diagonal direction, which will be given here in this way. So this is the general form of a, of a four by four tight binding Bloch Hamiltonian without any constraints on the amplitudes T, U, V, or W. Now, we are going to start imposing some constraints by uh, considering the symmetries which are present. So, as I said, uh, there will be glide plane. No, actually, we want it. We want this general 4x4 
four by four matrix to be invariant under the glide plane matrix or transformation. So which means that this matrix has to obey this relation with the G matrix. And also uh, we have seen that uh, the structure that we uh, want to propose will also have inversion symmetry, which means that the Hamiltonian has to be invariant with I, which is the matrix that represents the inversion point symmetry in this uh, effective model. And the invariance relation is such. And, and also uh, the, the system has time reversal symmetry. It's a spinless model. And this type of entry of the Bloch Hamiltonian, we well, in general, the model, the, the, the structures that we are proposing have time reversal symmetry. So we also impose time reversal symmetry, which means that age has to uh, obey this invariance relation with T, where T is the matrix that implements time reversal symmetry. And uh, these are the matrices for the type of, uh, of minimal lattice that we propose or effective lattice. G, which I have already shown, for, for inversion point, the matrix will be simpler. Uh, it's this uh, ga uh, 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 gamma X matrix is just the Pauli matrix, gamma X matrix, not gamma, sigma, sigma X. And for a spinless model T, which is the matrix that implements uh, the time reversal invariance relation in this way here, it's just un uh, identity. Okay, so then we just plug in the matrices in here and age, and we collect the constraints which are going to be imposed in the entries of the uh, Hamiltonian matrix. You can, it's a bit lengthy kind of calculation, but it can be done by hand. And then you, then you just uh, diagonalize the result in Hamiltonian. And then I'm going to show you the results, which you can uh, uh, obtain by putting the Hamiltonian in Mathematica, for example. And then uh, I'm going to show you what happens when you impose the symmetries one by one. So first, you just impose the glide plane transformation. And then the bands in the first quadrant of the KX, KY plane will look like this, four bands. And you see that for KY equals zero, the, the, the four bands touch pairwise at some point along KX. And the same for KY equals pi, the bands touch pairwise at some generic point at KX. Here, if you just project the band touching points on the KX, KY plane, that's what you, you're gonna see, two, two, two band touching points at KX equal, at KY equals pi and two, two band touching points at KY, equal, KY equals zero. But as I said, at generic places in the, along KX. Now, if you, so this is just the summary of what I have just stated. Uh, now, if you move on and add or impose that your Bloch Hamiltonian must be invariant under the inversion symmetry, then what happens is that the four bands now will look like this. The touching points, which were before uh, located at generic places around uh, along Kx, will all all of them will be pushed to kx equal, equals pi. So, so the nodal points, nodal meaning that the points where the bands touch, uh, will get pushed to kx equal pi when you add inversion point symmetry. And then by uh, enforcing time reversal symmetry, you what you get is that these, uh, e, uh, these four nodal points, they pairwise connect along the kx equals pi line or edge of the Brillouin zone. And moreover, there will be another, uh, 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 an added nodal line where the where these bands touch. It's not, I, I don't think you actually can see it here because you would have to twist or to turn this band structure around, but you you get also uh, accidental, and I'm, I'm, I will talk about that in a moment, accidental nodal line at ky equals zero upon introducing time reversal symmetry. And uh, these two orange and blue nodal lines, they are symmetry enforced, while this 
pink one is accidental in that, for example, uh, if you introduce an isotropy in your effective Hamiltonian, and the reason why we introduce an isotropy in our effect Hamilton, effective Hamiltonian is because in the real materials, when you introduce vacancies, you break the anisotropy of the hoppings in, in the sense that now different directions in the lattice might have or will have hoppings with different strengths because there are there are directions in the in the lattice which are empty and then uh it, this changes the 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 strength of the hoppings uh through the lattice and and then before in the pristine case materials the hopping was uh, independent of the direction, and now it's not anymore. So um, it's an isotropic. And if you put that in your Hamiltonian, just saying that uh, you just allow that the strengths of these parameters T, U, and V uh, will have, you just allow that these parameters will have a different strength. Uh, what happens is that now you create additional band crossings or band touchings along lines in the interior of the brilliant zone. So when you introduce this anisotropy, you, you see that, first of all, this previously, the, this accidental nodal line at ky equals zero disappears, but you gain other accidental nodal lines inside the brilliant zone, not at the edges, but inside the brilliant zone. And here's just an illustration that shows that by changing the uh, relations between the anisotropic parameter hoppings, you can move this accidental nodal line inside the brilliant zone and make it change shape, which might be interesting for applications. I, 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 maybe I, I will not have time to talk about that, but yeah, let's see. Uh, so these are some DFT results which co confirm our analytical predictions for the effective Hamiltonian or uh, model. Uh, for example, borofin B10 has this kind of band structure. So the XV direction uh, corresponds to a KX equal pi edge of the brilliant zone. So you see that every two bands, as soon as they enter this edge of the XV edge of the brilliant zone, they stick pairwise forming nodal lines. So if you project this band structure or the difference between the uh, between uh, two pairs of bands on the KX, KY plane, and then use a color code to show the interband gap where yellow to, 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 to white means zero interband gap and black is gap. So you see that the nodal lines, which are here represented by the golden structures, uh, so, so you see that the gold, you're going to see the nodal lines projected on the KX, KY plane here uh, are highlighted as these golden structures. So again, you see that at KX equals plus or minus pi over A, where A is the lattice spacing uh, in the real material along the X direction, uh, you see that you have these nodal lines at the correct edge, at the, the predicted edge which are symmetry enforced. They are rooted in the presence of the glide plane. And then you also get, you collect these accidental nodal lines in the brilliant zone, which are uh, induced by anisotropy, which is a side product of uh, introducing vacancies. And you see that if this is a band, this is a projection of the nodal lines on the KX, KY plane for spin orbit coupling, without spin orbit coupling. You can do the same kind of calculation introducing a spin orbit coupling in your Hamiltonian and run again the DFT uh, machinery. And you see that now that the nodal lines, the accidental nodal lines in the interior of the brilliant zone are split. So there is a spin split of these accidental nodal lines. However, they, they are still there under very, very strong sock, very strong spin orbit coupling, which means that they are unusually robust to spin orbit coupling, which is not common for accidental band degeneracies. They tend to, to gap out uh, for very, for, as soon as you put spin orbit coupling. And, and here you have this unusual robustness and we, 
uh, trace this robustness of the accidental nodal lines in the in the interior of the brilliant zone to their anisotropic origin. Although they are not enforced by symmetry, they are still rooted in a structural uh, uh, as, uh, property of your material, of your crystal, and therefore they tend to be rather robust to perturbations as well. And these are the, I, I'm going to start moving a bit faster now because I'm almost out of time. So these are uh, similar results for another type of vacancy engineered borophin. These were for B10. Here for B16, you will get the same, exactly the same type of uh, results and conclusions. And for graphene C10, we see that, so here is the band structure. So you get now uh, symmetry enforced nodal lines along the other edge, Ky equals pi, of the brilliant zone. And that's because for this structure, if you remember, uh, the glide uh, line is, is in the other direction, is in the direction that, in the y direction. So the ky, the, the, the k invariant edge of the brilliant zone is ky instead of kx. So if you then just remember that, you understand that now the nodal lines must appear along the yv edge of the brilliant zone, which are indicated here which corresponds to ky equals pi. Um, and then if you just project the nodal lines on the kx, ky plane, you see that indeed you have this well-defined nodal lines along the ky equals pi divided by b, where b, the lattice spacing along the y direction, but also uh, accidental nodal lines inside the brilliant zone, which are rather robust to spin orbit coupling. I'm gonna show you that in a moment. And uh, this is for C44, graph, another type of vacancy engineered graphene. You get the same type of, of results. The difference now is that uh, now you have a nodal line circulating or surrounding the, the whole boundary of the brilliant zone, kx equals pi and kx equals ky equals pi, because now you for this C44, you have two orthogonal glide planes which means that both edges of the brilliant zone, each pair of edge is uh, in the invariant subspace of one of the glide planes. So you have nodal lines all around the brilliant zone and internal accidental nodal lines, which come from anisotropy, as I have said. And uh, if you just, uh, for example, we consider a tight binding Hamiltonian force for C44, uh, which will be like this. And uh, if you just diagonalize this kind of Hamiltonian uh, with uh, Mathematica, you'll get the band structures without, spin when lambda sock is the strength of spin orbit coupling. So here is the without, and here is for very, very large, even experimentally unattainable uh, uh, value of lambda, uh, of, of, rash, of rash by spin orbit coupling of, of uh, ten, uh, 0 0.1, the strength of the hopping, which for graphene is actually very large uh, value. Uh, but the, 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 the aim is just to show the effect of rash basoc even for such a large value. What happens is that, well, each band without any sock, the, all the bands throughout the brilliant zone, any in any point of the brilliant zones, all the bands are already twofold degenerate because there is no spin orbit coupling, so the bands are spin degenerate. So uh, therefore, along x v and y v, which are the uh, brilliant zones edges, you have nodal lines which are fourfold degenerate. When you introduce a, a rash by spin orbit coupling as strong as zero point one. T, where T is the hopping, the strength of the hopping in the kinetic part of the Hamiltonian, you see that the, the spin degeneracy is left throughout the brilliant zone. So each one of these spin degenerate bands is split into spin polarized bands. And then now your nodal lines are not no longer two fourfold degenerate, they are twofold degenerate and spin polarized. 
because each nodal line is for one species of, of spin. So you see that their nodal lines will still be there for a value of spin orbit coupling, which is very strong, even unattainable and ex experimentally, which is a, com uh, a confirmation of our uh, analytical expectation that if a perturbation such as spin orbit coupling preserves the glide plane symmetries, no matter how strong, it will not destroy the band degeneracies, which are enforced by the glide plane symmetry. It can open, it can lift, for example, the spin degeneracy, but the remaining two-fold degeneracy that comes from the symmetry enforcement cannot be lifted. And with that, I come to my re final remarks, which are that first, uh, we have seen that a two-dimensional very everyday, I would say, uh, non-symorphic materials such as graphene or borophene uh, can be engineered with vacancies uh, to host symmetry enforced nodal lines at the brillium one zone, at the uh, symmetry invariant border of the brillium one zone. And also, uh, as a side effect uh, of introducing vacancies, you, you create an isotropy in your crystal, which uh, yields also accidental nodal lines inside the brillium one zone, which can be moved around in the brillium one zone and change shape and are unusually robust to perturbations. And DFT uh, res uh, results uh, confirm these expectations for graphene and borophene. Um, and uh, I would like to point out that our proposal, proposal is based solely on symmetries, so it does not actually rely on the chemical composition being it boron, carbon, it doesn't matter the type of atom, uh, and also other details of the structure of the of the material, such as the strengths of the of the bonds or or the original uh, crystalline structure. It only relies on the emerging symmetries that you engineer by uh, introducing vacancies in your crystal. And as an outlook, we would like to investigate what, how, how do the edge states of such materials will look like. Uh, also, we want to investigate the emergence of topological superconductivity starting from such uh, structures. Uh, Prosimate effect, uh, how with, with, with uh, magnetic materials and how uh, it can affect the band structure to design for further emergent properties of these uh, materials, among some other things that we are interested in. And uh, the take home message is that it's possible to engineer topological and robust nodal line semi metals simply by poking holes in a simple structure. And uh, we think that this opens a new path to material designs. Uh, of uh, topological semi-metals. Thank you very much for your attention. Juliana, thank you very much for the very <laughs> nice and very uh, didactic uh, seminar. Uh, this uh, seminar is open to questions. Uh, does anyone, if you don't have a, a microphone, you can type it on, on the chat. Tomé, uh, he has his hand up. He has his hand up. Okay, Tomé, go ahead. You, you don't have a sound. Your mic is off. Uh, you should turn your, your mic. Oops. Not yet. Uh, we are having that problem again. He might want to type in the... Okay. 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 He he has a Mac, so it, possibly that's the problem. Maybe. Mm. So, uh, maybe while he types, we can. Uh, Edson, you have a question. Uh, I actually I do thank you, uh, Mariana, for a nice talk. And
And uh, my question is actually pe perhaps rather naive or, or the answer is trivial. But I uh, apologize for that. And uh, when you, you talk about, you show that uh, uh, accidental nodal lines, so you said uh, they are introduced by anisotropy. Is that right? Yes. Okay. I was wondering if you, by some perturbation you could get rid of those. Uh, for instance, uh, spin orbit doesn't, but what about interaction? Oh, okay. So actually, a spin orbit will eventually uh, destroy those internal nodal lines which are not enforced by symmetry. However, what we found by uh, inspecting the robustness of these nodal lines under spin orbit coupling, Rashba type, is that they, they tend to, to survive rather strong values of spin orbit coupling, which are, which are we, we consider to be very unusual uh, phenomenon. Because in real materials, what you actually normally get is that um, accidental band degeneracies, be them nodal lines or just points, they tend to be very, very fragile to spin orbit coupling, to rush with spin orbit coupling in, in, in that sense. So in, inside the brilliant zone, so they immediately gap out. So um, in, in this case, they will also gap out, but for rather va larger values. So we interpret this unusual robustness uh, as to to be as to to to, to come to, we, we, we interp interpret this uh, in the sense that these uh, accidental nodal lines although accidental they are rooted in a structural uh, uh, feature of the crystal which is then isotro an isotropy between the hopping parameters which arise as a side effect of of poking holes in the crystal. So when you introduce a perturbation, for example, spin orbit coupling, you rather enhance an isotropy than, than, than recover it, right? So it's very hard to make the system less anisotropic when you put, uh, when you introduce perturbations. So what I mean to say is that these accidental nodal lines, because they are a side product of anisotropy, although accidental, they, they tend to be very robust because anisotropy will not be recovered. But eventually they will also go away. But for very, very large values of a perturbation that, you know, gain, uh, dominate over the anisotropic effect. So any perturbation, be it spin orbit coupling or interactions between the electrons, will tend to have a similar effect, I, I would say. Okay, thank you. Tomé um, is still working on his No, Here is his, uh, I think you can read from the chat, uh, Mariana? Yes. Okay. Uh, very nice talk, Mariana, thank you. Uh, my question, you keep time reversal symmetry and, well, inversion symmetry. If you break one of them, you could get vial semi-metal. Did you check that? Yes, uh, and also I think that's actually uh, uh, so let me go back to one of my slides. Do you see this slide with uh, the four bands of defective model? See, it's called symmetry analysis and defective model. Am I projecting the slide? Yes, yes. Yeah, so if yeah. you, for example, if you are in, in this stage, or rather, uh, let's say you do not impose time reversal symmetry. For example, you have a magnetic field. So you don't have time reversal symmetry. Then what you actually get for this type of effective model is uh, four nodal points, not lines, uh, pairwise located at the two 
glide plane invariant uh, edges of the brilliant zone, namely ky equals zero and ky equal pi. So here you wouldn't have a nodal line semi-metal, but a point-like semi-metal. While whether it will be vial-like, I I don't know if I could say that these points would be vial points or direct points. I would have to, to think about this. And also uh, by breaking inversion symmetry, so then you, you're here, you just have the glide plane symmetry, then these points are not anymore uh, obliged to be at kx equal pi, so they can be anywhere in the along the kx axis. And actually, in this case, they actually kind of look like vial points that can be moved around along at least maybe one edge or, or plane in the case of, case of vial points, they are in three dimensions, but they can be moved in the invariant plane of the brilliant zone. And this is analogous that these two points can now move around in the invariant, now not plane, but line, kx, ky equals pi and ky equals zero of the brilliant zone without, without inversion symmetry, with, with only glide symmetry, light plane symmetry. Any more? Uh, Tomé, are you happy? Um, I, I, maybe I have uh, one question. Oh, yes. Um, just something that I'm always like, like, like in, in, in the last case you were discussing, you have these crossing points, which can be Y points and things, but then I mean, you still have to guarantee if you really want to propose some material that there's not like usual metals around that will just dominate everything, right? I mean, it's a statement about the presence of these crossings, but you want them to be to give the leading contribution to 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 the to the properties of the material, right? I mean, if yeah. there's so so, so <clears throat> I mean, um, these symmetry arguments and so on are, are very nice. So actually, very nice talk and everything. But in the end, you always have to to make sure, right, that there's not just like trivial metals around that will dominate everything, right? Like for a specific proposal. Is... Mm -hmm. Do you mean that, uh, for example, if you consider that your actual physical material might be deposited on some trivial metal? No, no. I just mean like if 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 you start out from from your analysis, you can, for example, guarantee the pr the presence of uh, nodal lines or maybe some crossing points. If like in, in the case you were just showing, but you can still have like usual, I mean, metallic bands around that will dominate everything, right? Like in graphene, you have the case that the Fermi surface only consists of of the of the Dirac points, but uh -huh. in general cases, you can have just, I mean bands crossing the gap and they will dominate everything. So, I mean, you ah. have to. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, then isn't that a matter of where you experimentally set your Fermi level? Well, the question is if, if the point where you have, for example, the, the crossing now, now in the node lines, I have to think more, but if you have just a sim, sim, simple crossing like points, then you have to make sure that they're within uh, regions in, in, in like where, where all other other states are gapped out, right? That ah, there's yeah, no metallic yeah. bands crossing, and that yeah. depends very much on the specific material. Oh so, yeah. yeah, yeah, that that's right. So if we look, say, um, uh, let's say, well, that's the typical band structure, right? So this is for borophene, uh, not borophene you're vacancy you're engineer. Showing. You're not showing, Maria. No. No, if for some reason your uh, your ah, okay. Let me. I think I, I I might have clicked on on something. Yeah, maybe it, if you don't mess with it, it uh, stops for some reason. And now? Yeah, there you go. Yeah, there you go. Working. So this is a typical band structure for vacancy engineered borophene. We call it V10. So these nodal lines, uh, how can we understand this? So if, say, you put your Fermi level at zero. 
Ah, it actually is around. It's already, sorry. It's already E minus uh, Fermi energy for DFT results. So zero here is your Fermi energy, right? So if you cross the Fermi and so crossing the band structure at the Fermi energy, for example, you are you exactly capture this nodal line. And at this edge of the brilliant one zone, there is nothing else around that. Right. In that but, energy window. But but in the remaining, I mean brilliant zone, there, there there's plenty of other bands crossing, right? But this is inside the brilliant one zone. There, all, there will always be. Right, but but isn't that masking everything? Like in, in the end, you have like a you have your you have your nodal lines, but you have a lot of like usual metals around, and isn't that masking everything? Uh, I'm not sure because these these states are for different momenta. So if you're just measuring states for at the edge of the brilliant zone, which is where the nodal line is. You won't get contributions of this uh, metallic states, which right. come from different, which which have different momentum. Right, but I was thought, thinking of like transport experiments or whatever. So there you, uh, you will find. Uh, oh, right. Then uh, you yes. are not specifying the momentum when you do these experiments. T transport experiments. Yeah, all momenta uh, uh, come. Basically, yeah, and then in this basically. case, then in this case, I you probably cannot get rid of this metallic uh, states. They'll be there, and yeah, then I I cannot make any statement for this kind of measurement. Right, I'm but not, maybe yeah. an experimentalist could have could come up with some nice idea how to isolate the uh, nodal line states. Semi-metallic states associated to the nodal lines from the ordinary metallic state states that come from other places in the brilliant one zone, but I don't know how it's experimentally. I, I don't can say much. Right, or I, I mean, I, I was wondering if there are certain structures you can start out from that you, you you know that like it's more likely not to have this problem, like that you really only generate your nodal metal line metal. Uh, and everything others get, but but probably that depends a lot of. I mean, yeah, you really. Have to I look think that's a matter of luck, yeah. right? So yes, you just yes. get some structure. You look at the the band. You get some material. You you look at the band structure and see if you have a nodal line which is not surrounded by metallic. Or you bands. do a machine learning search. Or or that. Yeah. Uh, machine learning search could could give something. Let me. Uh, I, I think I think uh, Dennis had his hand up. I uh, think, uh, but I can't see anymore. But I think he has a question. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Hi, Mariana. Very nice talk. I very much enjoy. I have one question and one comment. Uh, so maybe the comment to the previous question is that you can maybe see the nodal lines in magnetotransport. So they will be surrounded by metallic states. But these, as in three-dimensional semi-metals, you are having these Fermi arcs. And then you can have interesting edge transport, which can be basically mediated via these uh, uh, nodal states. So that's my just hypothesis, that maybe one can see them in the magnetotransport. So that's the comment to the previous question. And now, uh, to, or, and now my question. Mariana, would you think that also in 3D, your arguments will be so strong? Assume that you will have a screw axis or something like that, that the, also, those symmetries will really preserve also the things in 3D? That's my I think question. So. I think so. Uh, well, the basic reason why we haven't looked at 3D is because we wanted to come up with the easiest, the, the simplest kind of materials that already have the desired features. But so we, we in our it might be naive, but we thought that it would be easier in 2D. Maybe experimentally, it's not so easy to produce to produce sheets with a periodic d distribution of vacancies because you know it's rather a bottom-up kind of process than just you get the pristine material and you remove, right? So it's 
technically it might not be so easy to do in 2D either, but uh, but answering our question, I think that 3D would give you the same kind of uh, phenomenon because it only relies on the symmetry. So if you produce a non-symorphic glide plane or a screw axis, the good thing of 3D is that you have two options, glide plane and screw axis. And in 2D, you just have the glide line or lines. Uh, but yeah, so in 3D, if you can produce a screw axis or a glide plane with vacancies, I would imagine that this would lead uh, in a similar way to nodal lines at the corresponding invariant edge of the brilliant zone. But now the invariant edge would be a plane, not a line. The nodal lines actually could have more interesting uh, features because now they are, since they are on a plane, then can be closed lines, they can have different forms. So it could be interesting to to research that. I have a I have a comment and uh, and a question. I I had this impression and maybe uh, an intuitive feeling that if you make your uh, unit cell larger, it seems that the effect is stronger because you when you had the C forty four. You had that beautiful uh, nodal line that went all the way around the the Fermi's, uh, the, the brilliant zone. Ah. Uh -huh. Your and this was uh, C forty four. The impression I have is that the bigger is the unit cell, you can you can do a lot of perturbation, and as your unit cell is so big, this perturbation is going to be averaged out. And when you when you glide one unit cell on the top of the other, they will look similar. You may have moved a lot of atoms, but you have so many atoms that they it will look similar. So it's very strong. It's a very strong. Uh, uh, am I right? Mm, that's or... an interesting point. Uh, am I still sharing? Yes. The, the slides. Yes. So this is the C44 yeah. uh, band structure. So here, uh, so the first comment that I want to make is that the fact that the nodal line surrounds the whole uh, the, the, the whole boundary of the brilliant zone here is not connected to the size of the unit cell. Rather, okay. it's it comes from the fact that this structure has two glide planes. So okay. it's different from, for example, uh, this one where well, you have you get the same for a smaller for a smaller unit cell. Yeah, so so if you look for a smaller unit cell, for for example, this one uh, is uh, C16. Okay. And then it has a glide plane, but in a, a orthogonal to the glide plane, it has a reflection plane. C44, not just not because of the size of the unit cell, but because of mm -hmm. the pattern that it produces, okay. has two orthogonal planes, glide planes. And therefore, the whole boundary of the brilliant zone is surrounded by nodal lines. That's not a feature of the size of the unit yeah. cell, but just the presence of two, like I said, two orthogonal glide planes. It's more, it's more symmetric. It, yes, it has two. Okay. Yeah, that, that it's, it's, it's like, not necessarily it's more symmetric, but it has, uh, the symmetries are, are such that, you have that to... instead of a reflection plane, a, a horizontal reflection plane here, like C16, it has the two reflection planes of pristine graphene gave place to two orthogonal glide planes. Uh, and that's, that yields uh, nodal lines at both edges of the brilliant zone. Okay. Now, another thing is that since the unit cell is so large, I think the point is that any local perturbation is very 
uh, going to be minor. It's very minor compared to the size of the unit cell, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah but um, I, I, yeah. So I agree with this statement, but I don't see how it uh, exactly connects with. No, the, no. I thought. Uh, I thought. I thought that for some reason I thought that this was more robust. But the idea that the unicell is bigger means that it probably is more robust against uh, perturbations of individual atoms. If your unit cell has four atoms and you move one, it's 25%. If your yeah. unit cell has 40 and you move one, it's, uh, it's very little, so the effect is going to be very small. So yeah. that was the... Yeah, this is, but this is another type of robustness, I would say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, which we haven't uh, yeah. investigated. This robust, so these nodal lines around the brilliant zone here, uh, actually, it's kind of misleading to to call them robust because they are not. It's they are symmetry enforced. They are like hundred percent robust. Okay. Okay. Right. So this, you you could say that these internal ones are robust to spin orbit coupling and unusually robust in that they they survive rather strong uh, stresses of spin orbit coupling but this one since the spin orbit rash by spin orbit coupling doesn't break the underlying symmetries it it there's no the lines around the brilliant one zone they, they are, will be there for they are immune. arbitrarily large okay okay perturbations the, yeah. the other question is uh, how how is the uh, the experimental side of this uh, research? So what are are there exa experimental examples of systems like that that where these kind of things have been investigated? So uh, there are experimental realizations of vacancy engineered borofins. Uh, I don't have. Right now, the 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 references to, but they they are listed in our archive. So okay. we, just, we we gave a brief overview of uh, the experimental uh, status of bor of vacancy of borofin with vacancies, and there are okay. a number of different kinds of so-called allotropes of borofin for different concentrations of vacancies. Uh, several of which have been experimental, experimentally realized, but for some reason, nobody was looking for non-symorphic patterns. Mm -hmm. So they were uh, introducing vacancies for different purposes. So we are now trying to convince the experimentalists. We, 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 we are talking to some experimentalists to see if some People would be interested to, you know, realize these materials with vacancies, but specifically uh, with non uh, to to um, fabricate fabricate a non symorphic structure because okay. vacancies it's known that it's possible to to insert. The point is that to get the non symorphic glide plane, these vacancies have to be uh, located uh, in certain positions in the lattice. And for graphene, there is also so-called Holley graphene, which is graphene with holes, which have been experimentally realized. But again, people were not looking for non-symorphic patterns. So, yeah, okay. that's, as far as I know, that's the experimental um, status. I think it's possible. And uh, these Holley graphene as well as borophenes have been realized, but... Uh, now uh, it's a question of making it specifically non-symorphic. Okay, okay. So any more, any more questions uh, either on the chat or microphone? I see that uh, yeah, everybody is saying thank you and uh, very nice talk. So, Edson, any any questions? No. If not, I just let's want thank to say, speak I just again. want to say that now Tomek can talk. Now can Tomek can talk? Yeah. No, no, he no, can't. No, not yet. Oh. No, I think oh. he, it's a Mac problem. He has a Mac. It's a... Uh, yeah. Yeah, okay.
Well, guys. Ariana, thank you very much. We're going to have your talk uh, posted next week in our YouTube channel. So thank if you, you want to pass it along to collaborators, the students, uh, uh, Edson, you can send an email to Edson and uh, Edson has the link. Thank yeah. you very um, much. If you, if you don't mind, if you send your your PDF uh, slides, yeah, I it's can also to, post. Yeah, I gonna. If you, if you, I have to send to send an email to Eduardo also to send to ask for his. Yeah. Um, beginning beginning of the of the semester, we we forget some stuff. So yeah, I'm gonna send you an email asking for the for the slides. Right. And then it's going to be posted there together with the video. Okay, so I will just await your email then. No problem. I might, I might need to do some uh, mod, uh, adjustments because I have the PowerPoint yeah. and probably you, you need a PDF. Uh, PDF. No, I think. Oh, no, you can, you can also send you, the PowerPoint, no problem. Can it, oh, okay, because uh, yeah. the PDF doesn't have any animations and then yeah, it, it changes yeah. no. a bit the, the mm. structure. No, uh, PowerPoint is okay. Oh, that's that's fine then. Okay.